What we're going to look at in this video is what happens to a dynamic equilibrium when you change a condition about it. So you could change the concentration of one of the substances in the equation. You could change the temperature of the system. If you've got gases, you could change the pressure of the system. And you could also add a catalyst. So any of those factors will do something to the position of the equilibrium. So before we start looking at these factors, I need to mention a very important principle we use in chemistry, and it's known as Le Chatelier's principle. And you can see it's written there on the whiteboard. So when a system in dynamic equilibrium is subjected to a change, the position of the equilibrium will shift to minimize the change. So the changes that we're going to look at are concentration, pressure, but that's just for gaseous equilibria, temperature, and adding a catalyst. So we'll start with concentration. So I've drawn on the whiteboard there a dynamic equilibrium that exists between sulfur dioxide, oxygen and sulfur trioxide. So remember when this is at dynamic equilibrium the rates of the forward reaction equal the rate of the reverse reaction and because of that the concentrations of everything in the system remain constant. So let's imagine it's at equilibrium and then we change the concentration of let's say the sulfur dioxide. So some more sulfur dioxide is added. This will upset the position of the equilibrium. And Le Chatelier's principle states that the equilibrium will shift to minimize what you've done. So if we increase the concentration of this Effectively, the equilibrium wants to cancel out what we've done, so it wants to get rid of the extra SO2. So how does it do that? Well, more oxygen, this oxygen here, will react with the extra SO2, and that will send the equilibrium over to the right-hand side. The same would go if we increase the amount of oxygen. So if we increase the concentration of this reactant now, the equilibrium will be disrupted, it wants to get back to equilibrium and so the SO2 now will try and get rid of that extra oxygen by reacting with it more so the forward reaction proceeds more and therefore the equilibrium position shifts over to the right hand side. So let's suppose we now increase the concentration of SO3 so some extra SO3 is added to the system. That's going to increase the concentration of the right hand side now. So the reverse reaction will take precedence. So the reverse reaction, remember, is the, is the decomposition of SO3. So if we've increased that, the equilibrium wants to get it back down again. So it does that by this splitting up. And so the equilibrium position would move to the left. And just a couple more to finish on this one. What if we reduce the concentration of SO3? So let's say something was added to remove SO3. Well, the equilibrium would respond. It would want to put SO3 back in. And so the forward reaction would occur more. And the equilibrium would shift over to the right to build this concentration back up. Likewise, if we reduce the concentration of either of the reactants, so these substances on the left, so if we reduce the SO2, then the equilibrium would respond by moving to the left-hand side to build the concentration of this back up. And so the reverse reaction would come into play more. If we look at pressure now, you can see I've added the state symbols now to the equilibrium. 
just to show you that these are all gaseous substances. With pressure, what you need to do first is establish which side has the greatest volume. So we have three moles of gas on the left hand side, two moles of SO2, one mole of O2, and we have two moles of gas on the right hand side. So at standard temperature and pressure that would be 3 times 24 decimeters cubed and that would have a volume of 2 times 24 decimeters cubed. So effectively this is the smaller side and this is the larger side. So we'll start with increasing the pressure. So if we increase the pressure of the system, what the equilibrium does is it responds to minimise the change by moving to the side with the fewest moles. So an increase in pressure will always move an equilibrium to the side with the fewest moles. So the fewest moles are on this side, so a high pressure would force this forwards reaction. It would make that more prominent and therefore the equilibrium position would shift over to the right. And so the opposite scenario, if we reduce the pressure, the equilibrium would want to effectively build the pressure back up and it does that by moving to the side with the largest moles, so it would expand and build the pressure back up. So you can see that this left hand side has three moles versus two. So pressure drop, equilibrium wants to build the pressure back up again, so it shifts to the side with the most moles. If we have a look at this equilibrium, so we have hydrogen reacting with iodine, and this is an equilibrium with two moles of HI. Now, have a think about pressure now. And remember what I told you, the first thing you need to do is establish which side has the most moles. So we've got two moles on the left-hand side, one of those and one of those. We've also got two moles on this side. So if you change the pressure, increase or decrease it will have no effect on the equilibrium position because there is no side with greater or fewer moles. Obviously if you increase the pressure the rate would go up, the rate of reactions would go up but both reactions would increase by the same amount. Remember increase in pressure um, you're forcing the particles closer together and so you're effectively increasing their concentration. So there'll be more successful collisions per second, but the position of the equilibrium won't be affected in this case. So we'll look at catalysts now, and we've got a very, very common equilibrium studied at A-level, and this is the equilibrium for the harbour process for the manufacture of ammonia. And you can see there we have three moles of hydrogen gas, two moles, sorry, one mole of nitrogen, and two moles of ammonia, all in equilibrium. There's an iron catalyst used in this process. Remember, catalysts provide an alternative route for the reaction with a lower activation energy. What we're looking at is, will the catalyst affect the position of the equilibrium? Well, the answer is no, and that's because the catalyst increases the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction by the same amount. And so therefore, just like when we had the, the same moles on each side, the iron catalyst on its own wouldn't affect the position of the equilibrium because both of the rates are increased by the same amount. So we're going to look at temperature finally. So we've got the sulfur dioxide, oxygen, sulfur trioxide equilibrium on the whiteboard there. 
Now to establish what's going to happen when we change the temperature, we need to know a little bit of extra information about the reaction. So you can see I've added some extra information now. This is the enthalpy change for the forwards reaction. So the delta H stands for enthalpy change. Now the important part about this information is this minus sign here in front of the 196. The fact that this is negative means that the forward reaction is exothermic. So negative delta H means an exothermic reaction. This refers to the forwards reaction, and so we now know that this is an exothermic process. In other words, it will release heat by proceeding in the forwards direction. So therefore, we now know that the reverse process must be the opposite of exothermic, so it must be endothermic. So let's suppose we increase the temperature once this has established the dynamic equilibrium. So we're changing the condition of temperature, we're increasing the temperature. Le Chatelier's principle says it will, it will move to minimise the change. So a way to think about this is if you heat it up, it wants to cancel that effect out. So we need to think about, well, which type of reaction will absorb the extra heat that you that you've introduced and the type of reaction that can do that is the endothermic reaction endothermic reactions absorb heat from the surroundings so if you increase the temperature it will favor the endothermic reaction and so the equilibrium will shift this way So let's do the opposite now. We'll lower the temperature. So the system was at equilibrium. We've lowered the temperature. And so Le Chatelier's principle would say that the equilibrium wants to minimize that change. So if you cool it down, it wants to heat back up again. Which reaction generates heat? Well, it's obviously the forwards reaction. And so this equilibrium will proceed more in the forwards exothermic direction if you lower the temperature. So if we quickly have a look at this equilibrium, so we've got carbon, water in equilibrium with carbon monoxide and hydrogen and you can see I've given you the delta H value so the enthalpy change for the forward reaction is positive 132 kilojoules per mole. What does that mean? It means that the forward reaction is endothermic. So positive delta H means endothermic. Therefore, the reverse reaction is exothermic. So if we increase the temperature, which direction will, will this equilibrium shift? Which which process will be favoured. So temperature up favours the endothermic direction and so the equilibrium will shift to the right and you'd get more products formed. If you shifted, sorry, if you cooled this equilibrium down, it will want to heat back up again and it does that by favouring the exothermic direction and so the equilibrium would shift to the left.